Video games are almost certainly richer as a medium now than they probably have ever been. We live in a world where 20 or so games are released on Steam a day, and still others are released on itch.io, the Epic Store, Origin, mobile platforms, the big three consoles, and sometimes, for some reason, Discord. This is an era where game development is more democratized than ever, and where walled gardens have slowly been eroded, where more people than ever have a shot at being able to put their game out there in front of a real audience and have their voices heard. In the past few months, I've played a Brazilian Metroidvania title, as well as horror games from Austria, Taiwan, and Indonesia. I've also streamed some really weird games, a single-player battle royale where you're a left-handed vampire who drinks energy drinks to jump real high for some reason, a barely coherent riff on 50s B-movies with questionable chin mapping, and a 2D beat-em-up that barely works with terrible prefab art assets but the incredible name of Fanatic Blader. I've played a game where I'm an escaped ape trying to take on my captors to a procedurally generated percussive jazz soundtrack. I've played a game where looking at objects from a different angle can turn them into totally new objects. I've played a first-person shooter JRPG hybrid that looks like a PSX game done in the Doom engine. I've played a game where I'm a kid in art school, a volunteer internet moderator in an alternate timeline 1990s, and a door-to-door -door salesman balancing depression and frustration. And again, all of that is from the past few months, and this is just the stuff I managed to nab as someone who casually tries to keep abreast of the weird underbelly of video games. The point is that there is a lot out there, way more than any single writer, YouTuber, or publication can handle. And it ranges from incredibly awesome, to really bad, to the so bad it's awesome. And as a consequence, you would think there would be more demand for critics than ever. There's this mountain of titles audiences need to sort through, opening up the need for someone to delve into that mess and separate the good from the bad, find gems hidden in the rough, or play tastemaker based on their own preferences for gameplay, writing, and thematic content. And yet, in my estimation, that's not really happening. I mean, obviously the big titles get coverage, and even a lot of the mid-tier indie stuff gets decent play on Twitch or YouTube or the various game sites, but that still leaves so much untapped, and it seems like it's getting worse, not better. In March of this year, GamesIndustry.biz posted an article from Fansensus's Kerry Davies that said their research showed the number of games shown by the top 10 influencers in 2018 was down to 28 games, where in previous years it had been in the hundreds. The amount of exposure most people are getting to games seems to be shrinking, not growing, even as the number of titles being released skyrockets. Part of that is the impact of algorithm-driven metrics. Steam, for example, is both the preeminent platform for PC game releases and also a service that loves its algorithmically generated recommendations and aggregated user reviews. No one outside of Valve has any real visibility into the details of how their recommendation engine works, but it's pretty clear it invests more in general popularity than it does in creating a complex profile of your preferences and finding similar games based on the minutia of individual titles. Which means hits become bigger hits, but it's hard for something relatively unknown to break through. And even if users stray away from Valve's own recommendations, they still needn't listen to a critic to make an informed purchase. Why spend time reading the detailed thoughts of a single person when you can rely on the binary yes or no, thumb up or thumb down wisdom of the tens, hundreds, or thousands of players that's already embedded right onto the store page? Is this game good? 8,000 or so people seem to all generally agree that it is, so sure, why not? But user review scores are prone to bombing and mobbing and can't really be trusted to be perfect, which is why we have a fallback system of aggregating professional game reviewer scores into a separate number on sites like Metacritic. The result is that the role of individual critics has been increasingly reduced. It used to be that you'd find a good publication or even a specific critic with whom you generally agree. Maybe not perfectly, but someone whom you'd trust a game recommendation from if it sounded up your alley. But by combining and adding up opinions on different sites and in different contexts, the need to have that ideal voice that can help you suss out the good from the bad matters less and less. It's now aggregate formula-driven consensus that drives the idea of whether a thing is bad or good. And because it's aggregate, it's usually removed from context. It's simply a binary yes or no. There's no longer a debate about the pros and cons of a game that might lead to consensus, there is simply the calculated average of the number of thumb ups and number of thumb downs. So that's one reason why demand for criticism feels flat. Another is the general decimation of the journalism industry as a whole due to stalling print sales, falling ad revenues, the difficulty of monetizing digital content in other ways, and venture capital's demand for infinite growth and mistreatment of web publications as tech stocks. And all of that is 
its own whole thing that I really don't have time to get into. It's a very large topic. But suffice it to say it makes it that much harder to cover niche titles because there's already economic and other pressure on publications from a ton of sources. It's hard enough to run a journalistic endeavor of any kind at all, let alone one that focuses on lesser known or more obscure works. And then there's YouTube, where there's a need to chase the algorithms and hop on the search engine optimization if I want to grow or even just maintain a degree of visibility in people's recommendations. That means covering big games, especially around the time of their release. If I were to talk this month about Sekiro or Mortal Kombat 11 or even an en vogue indie title like Risk of Rain 2, there's a good possibility my video could show up under topic banners related to those titles, or in recommendations at the end of videos other people have made on those games. But if I cover, say, Celestial Hacker Girl Jessica, a marble-based platformer that came out a year ago... I'm not going to get access to that sort of algorithmic exposure. Every time I cover a small game on this channel, I have to weigh the opportunity cost of not covering the game du jour. There's a reason these days that people like Ninja are known predominantly for one game with maybe the occasional experiment, or just being offered millions to spend a few days playing a different game. So game platforms aren't really designed to promote small titles, traditional publications struggle to pen very much about them, and YouTube and Twitch reward only covering the biggest things going. At every step in the process, there seem to be roadblocks to covering this sort of material. But there's one other thing that makes this hard, and I'm trying to tread carefully here. There also doesn't seem to be much demand for it from the player's side. Like, part of that is probably the previously mentioned user reviews and aggregation sites providing quality metrics at a glance. There's not as much demand from it from players because, again, you can get a quick look at whether a game is quote-unquote good or bad by just looking at the Steam page or looking it up on Metacritic, at least for titles big enough to show up on those sites. But another part of that is the way games are generally consumed by the public. What the smaller, quirkier parts of video games try to offer is often wildly divergent from what giant tentpole releases do. I mean, if you're watching this video, you are probably pretty into video games. But most people I know in real life who play games, co-workers, newish parents with young kids, etc., buy maybe two to four games a year. And they're all big tentpole releases that they want to last them until the next one comes out. Your Fallouts, your Grand Theft Autos, your Maddens, your Assassin's Creeds. They literally are not in the market for even a well-known indie title like Return of the Ober Din, never mind something truly off the beaten path. Like, as a personal anecdote, when my coworkers found out I made YouTube videos about video games, they would occasionally ask what I'd been playing, and when my answers included a visual novel about some gay teens at a summer camp that pulls influences from Lovecraftian horror and magical schoolgirl animes, or a paperwork game like Papers, Please, but commenting on the troubling potential fallout of Brexit, or even just a game about a cat living in a dying mining town in Pennsylvania, they learned to stop asking me what I was playing. Part of this is, I assume, my insufferable personality, but I also think that there were no follow-up questions because these titles struggle to generate interest in people to whom the scope of games is a blockbuster content extravaganza with a tight, easily understood gameplay loop. And all of this sounds very doom and gloom, but I don't want it to. I'm not here to bury the small, the experimental, the absurd, and the personal games of the world. I'm here to celebrate them. But all of this makes me wonder, do smaller games need more critics? Do they need people seeking to rank them, score them, and measure their worth? Are itch.io or the vast reaches of Steam's libraries just sorting problems that need a more human algorithm to truly crack and give you the best stuff at the top? Or do these games need champions? People to espouse their values, to push back against the recommendation engines and procedural curation and shout about the titles that fell through the cracks, to describe the small joys and awkward challenges and intimate moments or cool aesthetics that they present, to demand their worth in the public discourse despite their small stature and limited audience. The reality, of course, is that in a healthier environment, we could do some of both. I mean, look, you know this channel. The artsy-fartsy thematic stuff is my bread and butter, and believe me when I say that there are more veins worth mining in these obscure titles than in most tentpole fare. I can only complain about blockbuster games being a confused thematic mess, but so many times before people catch on that I'm making the same video over and over. And these small games spare me that fate by letting me talk about Vaporwave, or being an online kid in the 90s, or the philosophy of Alan Watts. But right now, in this moment, facing all the hurdles they face to get any penetration into the public mind whatsoever, I feel like advocacy is more important than deconstruction. After all, what good is a well-researched read on or critical evaluation of a game that only a handful of people have ever played? So I think in the coming weeks, I'm going to experiment with different ways to cover this stuff. I've tried once before, about a year ago, with 
less than stellar results, which I've published alongside this episode, for posterity. And, well, because content for the content gods. Ultimately, what I'm looking for is a way to talk about stuff that's broken, janky, personal, or even bad but in a good way, and share it with people who may vibe to it. To celebrate it in a way that's honest about its faults, but unambiguously positive. Because it's hard enough to find these games, let alone talk about them. And unless you're already one of the few to keep your ear to the ground for new titles, surely something I've shown footage of today you've never seen before, but kind of thought it looked cool and would like to know more. But in the meantime, keep your eyes peeled for smaller games that might strike your fancy. Follow Micro Trailers on Twitter. They take the trailers from literally every Steam game as they're released and compress them down to six seconds, making it real easy to view the game at a glance. Check out the weekly recommendation posts on itch.io. They tend to have some really good suggestions. Look around at other YouTubers and games writers covering this beat. While I'm still looking for a format that works for me, there are plenty of other people out there doing great work already. I'd recommend Chris Priestman's Twitter, or Cameron Kunzelman at Waypoint, or Dominic Terrison at Rock Paper Shotgun, for starters. Above all, just... Be open to new experiences. Janky ones, glitchy ones, badly translated ones, even good ones. People bemoan the churning landscape of endless games, but if you approach it with the right eyes, there's gold in them thar hills.